Washington Redskins, the National Football Conference champion. Against the Denver Broncos, the American Football Conference champion. In Super Bowl 22, live from San Diego, Jack Murphy Stadium. Thank you. I have the honor of coming up after a video of the Super Bowl in which we were ignominiously disgraced. Um, I do remember that Super Bowl. I almost went to it, but luckily for me, I made the decision at the last minute not to. Um, so uh, I'm Howard Boygan. It's my honor to welcome you back and to introduce our next speaker. I want to just make a couple of quick comments. Um, Dan talked at lunch about where we all were in 1988, which of course was the whole purpose of having this video, another 1988 episode in our lives. And he said that Walker Stapleton was probably listening to his Sony Walkman. Well, I still have my Sony Walkman. And in fact, when I go to Broncos games, I take it with me because it's the only way I can actually listen to the radio. And every time I, I walk up to the game and I'm, I've got these goofy headphones and this thing clipped onto my jersey, people start looking at me and they laugh. Uh, I think it's because of the Walkman, but um, it still works. So kudos to Sony for creating a whole industry, um, but I have a lot of affection for my Sony Walkman. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say before we get started is 1988, the first, um, chapter of this gas conference, it's all about Fred Julander. Fred, it was Fred's vision. Fred was the guy who created it. My late dear friend and client and colleague, Fred Julander, he was the visionary. He used to call himself Cassandra, it's, you know, doomed to be always correct and never believed. And um, he was always preaching that natural gas was the future. This is in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, that, that the Rockies were the Saudi Arabia of gas, and people would look at him like, what are you, crazy? Um, gas prices were, what, a buck? Whatever they were. Um, and we had all these issues on getting gas out of the Rockies, getting gas out of the ground. Um, uh, and the market was almost non-existent. And Fred kept saying, it's, natural gas is the future. And he was so right. And he created this conference literally by himself. Uh, soon afterward, David Posner joined him as a partner in making this thing happen, but for many years it was Fred, Mary Johnson, and David Posner who did this whole thing. So I just want us to remember and give credit, tribute, to Fred Julander, um, without whom we wouldn't be here. He's the one who got me involved in COGA, actually. Um, so with that, I also want to thank, again, our sponsors and our exhibitors and our presenters. For our exhibitors, please go out in the hall and, and talk to them and, and um, see what they have to offer. They're great folks and they do a lot for us. Um, and so we thank them. Um, and then with that, I will um, now introduce our speaker, Rick Allen. Um, Fred would have loved to hear this talk on natural gas markets overview. Fred lived for this kind of stuff. Um, so Rick Allen is uh, responsible for managing the consulting group at S&P Global Platts, a select team of highly experienced energy experts focused on the delivery of in-depth market analytics services to S&P Global Platts consulting clients. Utilizing the collective intelligence of Pira Energy Group, Bentec Energy, that's a good Denver name, and the Eclipse Energy Group. He has more than 25 years experience uh, in energy market analysis, infrastructure planning, and risk management in positions with Western Gas Resources, Anadarko, and Nexen Marketing USA. Prior to his energy experience, he held positions in commodity finance with UBS New York and regulatory compliance with uh, 
is it Bungie? Corporation, North America in New York. He holds a, a BBA in marketing from the University of Oklahoma, OU, and a JD from the Sturm College of Law and the University of Denver. Recovering lawyer, I take it. So with that, Rick Allen. Thanks, Howard. I gave this talk two years ago. Is there anyone here who was here then and can remember being here then? Anybody? I don't see any hands, so I can say I got everything right. No, there's one. All right, I'll come clean. I looked back at what I said two years ago, and I thought, all right, you don't get it always right. So what did I get right? What did I get wrong? And hopefully more right than wrong. The two biggest rights are, I said, we're going into a period of time where domestic demand will be outpaced by export demand. And, and that is critical for the continuing growth and production of natural gas in North America. I got that right. The other thing we got right, and I say we because I'm not doing all of this analysis. I've got a, the good fortune of working with about 75 really good analysts. So when I say we, I'm talking about that team. And when I say I, I'm talking about my personal opinion, if I remember to, to get those terms straight. The uh, other thing we got right was that we were entering into a trough of flat production and that the balance of 2016 and 2017 we'd see flat production. And the reason for that would be we wouldn't have enough demand creation and we would have pipeline bottlenecks specifically in the US Northeast. That turned out to be right as well. The thing we got terribly wrong was, I said two years ago, that export demand in 2018 would be 1.6 BCF a day. We missed that by over half. 2018 will average about 3 to 3.2 to 3.4 BCF a day of average exports through the LNG channel. So really miss that one. Um, so what happened in the last two years since I've been here? Can we start the slide deck, please? Two years ago, compared with now, we've added 610 rigs. This chart has bubbles with two numbers in each bubble. The number on the left is the number of rigs working in that location today. The number on the right is the change. Two years, 24 months, what happened? We added 600 rigs, now we're running 1,100 rigs. And I know that's not the most important metric, right? We all know that. But this is a big deal. We've doubled our rig count in two years. And so what that does mean is, instead of drilling an average of about 1,000 wells per month in the United States, we're now drilling 1,600 wells per month. So that's a big deal. That's a big change in two years' time. So the takeaways I want you to think about today are, again, what I said two years ago, production growth is highly dependent on export demand and export markets. Mexico and LNG exports combine in my five-year forecast to 10 billion cubic feet of incremental growth, incremental, while compared with organic demand in Canada and the US of only about 5.7. So almost double the demand increase from exports as organic demand. Another thing I want you to remember is that that's not the end of the story. We have gotten to a place in time where we can see what's coming as far as LNG liquefaction plants in the next five years. In my five-year forecast, we know what's coming. We can see it. We think that won't be enough to satisfy the growth in global LNG demand and that there will need to be another wave of projects. We expect that to happen. And they'll come into service maybe as early as 2024, maybe 2025, but sometime after this forecast period I'm working with today. We still need new infrastructure. We can't grow our market by 15 BCF without new infrastructure. One of the emerging 
issues we see is supply not connected to demand. So almost all of the demand is in the U.S. Gulf Coast. The supply regions are somewhere else. We need to connect the dots. That's really important going forward. I'll bring it back and talk about the DJ and the Rockies basins that are growing and give you a really quick view on some infrastructure challenges that the DJ has as well. So let's start with exports. Since the United States began an exporter, these are the destinations for the cargoes we've had. I want you to take a look at that map for a second. Send an LNG to the Middle East, Kuwait, Jordan, United Arab Emirates. I wouldn't have expected that when I started in this business. It's pretty neat. The number two biggest markets we have are in yellow. Number one, Mexico, 275 BCF to date. China, 163. China is a word I don't think I said at all two years ago. You're going to hear me say China a lot today. They're a growing, important part of the story. Those two were surprises. So about a third to Asia, about a third to Latin America, 17% in the Middle East, 10% in Europe, for a total of 1,240 billion cubic feet going to 27 countries. Pretty impressive story. I love this slide. I love this part of our story. Now looking forward, let's look at demand growth in the five-year forecast that we're working with. On the left, you see historical demand growth, broken out by those regions, Asia, Europe, Americas, Middle East, and other. This is the forecast. And going forward, you'll notice that Asia represents 50% of the demand growth in the LNG forecast that we have for the next five years. That's a really big deal. Now let's look at where Asia compares as far as supply and demand. What's the supply-demand balance? On top of the zero line, I'm going to give you the Asian LNG suppliers. Russia, Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and others. And on the bottom is, let me back up, on the bottom is the demand in Asia. And you can see over time, China, number one, the biggest growth market we have in the next five years, about 20% of total demand creation in China at 2.1 BCF. The forecast period has a growth of 10 BCF for this period of time. I'm going to draw the black line at the bottom, which compares the difference between supply and demand. If you're below the zero line, that means your demand outpaces your supply in this region of Asia. It's always been true. It peaked at 12.7 BCF a day average short position in 2014. We'll see that imbalance grow to 15.7 BCF at the end of the forecast period. So Asia gets shorter, even with the additions of capacity coming on primarily in Australia, but also Qatar will throw that in as well. Now let's look at the, uh, the picture of the suppliers coming online by region. Historically, you can see that on the left, uh, the growth in LNG coming online in the next five years, 10 BCF of total new liquefaction supply the blue is the United States, and it is by far the biggest addition to liquefaction capacity coming online in the next five years. That blue bar uh, represents an addition of six BCF a day of capacity in this five-year period. Australia adds another 1.5. Qatar adds another 1.5 for the total of 10. I mentioned we got this wrong last time. Two years ago, I would have told you that the utilization of the LNG capacity in the United States would have been about 60% utilized. We blew that forecast. We can see it's been very highly utilized, and so we've learned a lot. We've learned about emerging demand. We've learned about latent demand showing up in places we didn't expect it. We saw a surge in demand in China. We saw Mexico take a lot more LNG, even though they were uh, highly utilizing the pipeline imports as well. 
So this is a change in our thinking. We expect a highly utilized uh, liquefaction fleet, and we expect the market to remain tight. Just today, we saw prices for wintertime LNG in North Asia, the JKM marker, the Platts benchmark in Asia, already trading at $12. We've been above $10 this summer for LNG trades in Asia. So we do expect a market that will be tightening, and that will uh, contribute to that second wave of capacity that we expect to come on. We may see FID, final investment decision announcements this year for capacity that could come on in five or six years from now. Don't be surprised if you see an FID coming out before the end of this year for another uh, addition to the fleet, either in the US or Canada or in the west coast of Mexico. Now let's shift to Mexico and see what's going on there. The problem has been a delay in infrastructure. The average delay of interior pipeline projects is over 400 days. The X's on my map here point to some of the critical locations. Those dotted lines are pipeline projects that are not finished. And as I said, the average delay is over 400 days. And that has encouraged the increase in LNG imports into Mexico because we don't have a demand growth problem. Mexico's demand is growing significantly. But the need for the gas could not be supported by the development of the infrastructure. We expect that to be corrected later in 2019, uh, or later in 2018, and some more next year in 2019. Capacity will be enhanced, and we'll expect to see a higher utilization of the cross-border pipeline capacity as that downstream capacity catches up. This chart shows the difference. That black solid line at the top is cross-border capacity to get gas into Mexico from the US. The bottom dotted line, just above that magenta color, is the downstream takeaway capacity. And you can see how tight it is. It's literally full. We expect a peak of 4.9 BCF of pipeline exports to Mexico later this year in October. Then we get some expansion of downstream capacity, and we'll see another peak next year of 6.2. That will encourage a softening of the LNG imports into Mexico. Uh, last month and the month before that, June and July, Mexico averaged a BCF a day of imports of LNG. That will be able to soften somewhat. And by next summer, we expect that number to fall to about 600,000 a day, so a decrease of about 400. Now let's shift away from the export story and get into what's happening right here in the lower 48 and also in Canada. We've seen the biggest growth year over year in gas production that we've ever seen. And let's back up and look at what happened before that. 2013, we saw an increase. 2014, an increase of four BCF a day. We had another increase in 2015 of 3.5 BCF a day, and then we hit that flat spot that I talked about at the beginning. We expected that. It did happen. The next year was flat. The year after that was flat until November 2017. We finally broke out of the trough, and that was the takeaway capacity increases in the Northeast. We finally were able to break out, and now this year that just continues. We've already added year over year 5 BCF, average this year compared with the average of 2017. By the end of the year, we expect that increase to be a total of 7 BCF a day, year over year. Dramatic increase. And next year, 2019 over 2018, we're forecasting another 6 billion cubic feet. But I can't overstate the importance of that export market to make that happen. It's critical. We split North America into 11 different regions. We call this our cell model. This is how we break it up. We balance each region separately, distinctly, balancing its supply, which is production and inflows, against its local demand. That creates the forecast for outflows. That's limited by the capacity. The corridor capacity between each one of these is known. It's finite and the forecast is not allowed to exceed that capacity. What's happened 
or what will happen in the next five years. This is our forecast comparing 2023 average to 2018 average. Expect an addition of 16 BCF. And I said most of that is going to come in uh, 2019, or not most of it, but a, quite a big number, 6 billion cubic feet just in 2019 alone. How does that look regionally? Western Canada, 1.1. The Northeast continues to grow. That pipeline expansion program happened. There's ample capacity to get the gas out of the Northeast now. Southeast, we have increases in the Haynesville, and that's offsetting some of the declines in the other regions. Texas, mostly associated gas in the Permian, Eagleford, we have declining areas offsetting that, but a total increase of four and a half. Southwest, that's Permian, New Mexico, growth of almost a BCF in this forecast period. We have growth in the Oklahoma scoop stack primarily in that box. Midcon, that's a little bit of the Williston Basin uh, projections. Rocky Mountain increases, um, and it all adds up to 16 BCF. How will we balance that market? Let's look at demand side. We'll start with organic demand. So this, this chart does not include the exports. 1.9 in the Northeast. I showed you 7.5 of production increases in the Northeast. Organic demand is only 1.9. 1.9 in the Southeast, 0.6 in Texas, and you can see the rest. It only adds up to 4.8 if you exclude Canada and just look at the U.S. demand. We're in a very mature market. This is not a growing demand market for natural gas, at least not in a big way, not like we've seen in the past. So that's why exports are so important. I'm going to lay in some blue bubbles. That's the increase between 18 and 2023 of the LNG exports. That's Jordan Cove, just adding another 200. 3.3 in the southeast. That would be the Louisiana projects. 6.6 in Texas. That includes the LNG facilities at Corpus Christi and Freeport. And it also includes the pipeline flows into Mexico as well. Pipeline flows coming through Arizona are 0.3. The total increase, as I mentioned at the top, 10 BCF a day of exports. Now let's talk about power. We've reached a trough in, in uh, the creation of demand for electricity in the United States. We can look at the flat line. If you look at the difference between 1990 and 20, or 2007, you can see an increase average of 2% per annum. And then it flatlined, it stopped. 2007 was the all-time high year for electricity sales. It's been flat since then. That's the environment we're in now. So now it's a fight for market share. If you look at the generating fuels, who prevails in a largely flat market for power generation? And why is it flat? We have institutional structural changes, such as greater urbanization that softens some of the demand. We have better efficiency, more efficient appliances. We have better conservation as far as insulation and, and better building materials. We do have growing population, but it's offset by all these efficiencies and uh, cons uh, conservation efforts. So if we look at what's happened inside of that period of time between 2010 and 2016, when electricity sales were not growing, we did have a shift in the generating fuels for power. Chart on the left shows fossil fuels combined for 69%. Chart on the right shows a decrease in that six-year period to 63%. So gas is growing, but coal is falling faster. On the left, you see 2% renewables. On the right, 2016, that changed and ramped up to 7%. We expect that trend to continue. Our five-year forecast looks like this. Total demand increase for the whole five years added together is a 2% increase. So it's pretty flat. You can see the top of those bars not changing very much at all. 2% total. That's a typo. It's not 004% per year, it's 0.4% per year, a total of 2%. What does that mean for renewables? Renewables is taking more market share. 10% per annum 
increase for a total of 60% in this forecast period. So it's growing quite a lot on a percentage basis. However, it's still starting from a pretty small base. You can see how big that bar looks compared with the rest. Gas does increase, 1% per annum, about rounding up for a total increase of 3%. So it is growing, uh, not as big as it has in the past. We've already picked most of the low-hanging fruit for gas uh, market share development and don't expect to see a lot more uh, in the future. We do expect a gradual increase as some of that structural demand, such as urbanization, begins to uh, flatten out. So at the end of this forecast period, fossil fuels will have fallen to 60%. Renewables will have increased to 14%. And you can see that trend. I don't know how long that trend will go, uh, but we do expect it to continue at least for this five-year forecast period. Something that we've done a lot of work on lately is the difference between supply growth production growth, and the location where that's happening. And that's going to be primarily Permian Basin, associated gas, Oklahoma, the scoop stack, uh, and of course the Northeast. So you've got growing production far away from this circle. This oval, box, this oval I drew here is where significant, maybe 80% of the total demand creation is happening. There will come a time in this five-year forecast when there, was, there will not be enough infrastructure to supply that concentrated demand growth in this forecast period. We've spent a lot of time working on this. You need to get pipeline projects across that line, that constrained line. We see some coming. We believe by this time next year, we'll have a project connecting the Permian Basin to the Gulf Coast, very important. Will it be enough to serve that much demand creation? No, it won't. We're going to need more projects. So don't forget that. That's a really critical part of the story. We've done tons of work on that. We can give a lot of detail on that. And I hope you'll call me later and ask me to do that for you. Now let's look at the Rockies. I won't cover this in too much detail. We've seen a lot of really focused presentations on this. But let's at least take a recap and see what's happening. But first, let's look at this. This is a dynamic of how good the oil plays are and how little the oil plays depend on gas revenues. So to adjust our eyes to this chart, let me walk you through it. The y-axis on the left is looking at the dollar break-even, the crude oil price break-even mark for each one of these basins. If you change the gas price from the current break-even, which is the light blue bar, to $2, you move to that darker blue color. And that would be the break even if gas was $2 in that location. You can see that it actually improves the Montney and the Duvernay because they're not getting $2. If you change the price to $1, your break even changes again, and that is that red color. And finally, if you take the gas price to zero, your oil price increases, your oil break even price increases just a little bit. They look at the Williston on the left. The Williston Basin almost doesn't care at all whether it gets any revenue for gas or not. The Permian Midland on the far right side, same story. But look at the DJ. I wanted you to see the DJ right here in our backyard and see how true it is for the DJ too. So even though prices could be depressed locally, we still have strong incentive to develop the DJ. Now let's look at growth projections for the Rockies basin by basin. These are not a forecast, these are a projection. And what I mean by that is, if we held the current pace of development activity steady, same number of wells per month, same IP rates, same de decline curves, this is what we would get. DJ would grow by 760, the Green River Overthrust would grow by 200, and the total Rockies would be about five 22, half a BCF of growth, if we didn't change anything about the activity we're seeing today. So you can see a lot of decline in other areas, pulling that down. If you have almost 950 from two basins, 
The other ones are declining, and that's the 400 loss that gets you to the 500. So we talked about infrastructure. Very important here in the Rockies, DJ especially, and so we're focusing on this box where the biggest activity for the DJ is happening, and let's look at processing. We've heard about some processing enhancements. There's quite a lot happening. I think we are having an increase from 2.2 currently to 4 BCF uh, by the early part of 2019, so the processing constraints will be alleviated very soon. As far as pipeline takeaway from the DJ, we also expect increases coming soon. The big one is the Cheyenne connector, which will be coming online uh, toward the end of 2019, so just over a year from now, and that will give adequate gas takeaway for the DJ Basin as well. Now let's look at the bigger picture for the Rockies. Looking at takeaway to the east, that top chart shows primarily Rex, Trailblazer, and the WBI system, and you can see it running at full capacity, so it's full. The next corridor we're gonna look at is going to the Midcon producing, which is the uh, Oklahoma, Kansas region. It's approaching full as well. And if you're gonna have growth of 700 or even 600 or 500 from the DJ, eventually this could be a problem. This could be an opportunity for someone who's looking at long-term project development. Part of the story includes what's happening out west. We're not growing demand in a big way in the west. We already see uh, plenty of gas in the west. We're competing heavily, not only with the Permian Basin, but also with Western Canada, of course. Uh, the pipeline chart looks like this. Kern River has been close to full. We don't expect a lot of demand creation in the southwest. Another big story that's emerged lately is Permian gas coming across from Texas on uh, on the, um, uh, on the crossover pipelines, including Transwestern and El Paso, making their way back up into the Rockies. And the chart on the bottom right shows just exactly that. That corridor was designed to go from north to south, and it flipped recently, far right-hand side of the chart. You can see gas physically flowing from south to north for about 250,000 a day. It's almost at capacity on the south to north flow pattern. As soon as that Permian pipeline comes on, about a year from now, we expect that to go back to normal and the Rockies will get some relief because it won't be trying to find a home for its gas and the Permian gas as well. So that would be an improvement. So let's talk about upside. West Coast LNG exports, a big part of the Rockies story. Everybody's got their eyes on this, very important. What about Mexico? If you look at the project at Costa Azul, if you added capacity to Sasabe, uh, the, the Samalia Luca Sasabe line, you could add the Sonora pipeline, add compression, turn that brownfield plant around, make it an export facility, that could help. And I believe that any addition of LNG capacity on the West Coast, whether it's in Mexico or whether it's in Oregon or British Columbia, any of those projects would be beneficial to a Rockies producer. It will lift the boat. I really believe that to be true. This is a compelling project. A lot of work has already been done with permitting, uh, and it's got a lot of attributes that include uh, not having to go through Panama Canal, but also savings in shipping costs. If we look at the average cost in 2016, that route from Costa Azul would save about 70% to Japan, or 70 cents on an MMBTU basis moving from uh, Ensenada to Japan. So it's pretty interesting, it's an interesting project. Another one that we'd like to look at would be uh, either Oregon or British Columbia. Either one of those could help. And the reason I think it could help the Rockies, even if it's in British Columbia, is if we look at how much gas is flowing in from Canada now. That Sumas corridor in Washington is close to full. The Kingsgate capacity uh, is very full. And so if you opened up a 2.2 B, a BCF project at LNG Canada, you would either have to produce 2.2 billion cubic feet of additional incremental gas in Western Canada to serve that demand. Maybe you don't do quite that much. 
and you send less into the Pacific Northwest, and that opens up market share for Rocky's producers. So I think it could be a benefit to have an LNG uh, facility in Western Canada. Now, of course, Oregon would be even better for the Rockies. That's a direct connection. And if we look at pipeline capacity going to Oregon, uh, we look at the uh, Northwest Pipeline, plenty of capacity open there. Those white spaces are open capacity. And if we look at Ruby, the trend are, has been a declining throughput on Ruby, plenty of capacity to ramp up deliveries into Oregon if the Pacific Connector Pipeline gets built and the uh, Jordan Cove facility gets built. So all of this could be beneficial uh, for Rockies producers. Now let's talk about China again. There's been a lot of talk about a 25% tariff on US LNG exports to China, and I want to look at what that might mean. This is just the US deliveries of LNG to China so far to date in the red. I mentioned that China is the fastest growing market in the world with 2.1 BCF of increase in the next few years. And you want to put that in perspective. That's 20% of the total demand increase. China would become the number one, uh, or actually the number two LNG import country after Japan at the end of this forecast period, maybe eventually overtaking Japan as number one, but we think that would be probably at least 10 years away. But China is growing in importance as an LNG market. And it's very important to keep this in mind. If we're thinking about the competing liquefaction projects that are trying to get to FID, final investment decision announcements, and they're talking to prospective buyers, those could be Chinese buyers. They could be portfolio players who like the idea of being able to take cargoes into China. It's got to be weighing on all of their minds when they look at the potential for adding a 25% cost. So what could happen is if we don't get a quick resolution to this issue, we could drive that final investment decision to Mexico. We could drive it to British Columbia. And in either one of those cases, that could come before the next FID in the Gulf Coast. And so ironically, or maybe paradoxically, the tariff pushing the next project into Canada or Mexico could actually be a benefit to a Rockies producer, sort of in a backwards thinking way. So let's recap what we've talked about. Demand creation in the export markets is critical. We won't be able to continue this rapid pace of production gains if we don't continue to develop these markets. It's very important in the five-year window when we know what liquefaction capacity there will be, but we need to think about it too as a country when we think about trade policy and whether we want to participate in a big way in that next wave of LNG projects. Demand for LNG does continue. It's still not a saturated, mature market. If you think about the average five-year period uh, before the Sabine Pass came online, the market grew from 31 BCF a day to 41. Big increase, 31 to 41. Our forecast is to grow from 41 to 51 in this forecast period. It sounds like a lot, 25%, but when a market is so, it's kind of like the uh, solar market. It just isn't big enough for these kinds of gains to be problematic. Infrastructure development is a big story. Keep your eyes on it. That circle around the US Gulf Coast, you're going to hear more and more about the connectivity for that demand compared with where the supply is coming online. And as far as the Rockies go, we do have growth. GRO and DJ continue growing. We're going to need some infrastructure projects, but it looks like that's already been tackled. So that completes my prepared remarks, and I think uh, we may have some time for questions. Yes, so we have, we have a couple minutes for questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Rick, I'd never thought about the, the backhanded help from Trump on the tariff issue, but it makes a lot of sense uh, about growth going to Mexico and Canada. One of the things I've always been worried about that if the Canadian BC, or the BC LNG export facility is built, it'll just be filled by a growing Montney shale capacity, productive capacity. Is that 
something you you see? It absolutely could happen, John. I, I, I completely agree. I'm, I'm, um, I think it's one of those wait and see situations. I mean, we don't know how fast that could ramp up, but there could be a window of time where Rockies could take some market share in the PAC Northwest. You know, it's always a timing issue. I don't know how fast production could ramp up uh, prior to that demand coming on and whether that would uh, be a way around it, but I think there's really no place to go with that gas until you do have new demand. Do those new Northwest utilities, that do they want a pre-prescribed Canadian volume versus U.S. volume, or are they just buy where it's cheapest? Well, which market? Uh, the Northwest utilities, Portland General, Northwest Natural. No, I think it's all the same for them. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. When you look at the Asian markets and you're looking at the shipping, um, do you look at the changes in ultra-low diesel fuel and what that's going to do to our shipping fleets of moving LNGs to the Asian markets that goes into effect next year? We, so you're, are you talking about the IMO bunker fuel rule changes? Yeah, are going down to you know a half of a percent on sulfur right, emission. Right, right. That's going to be an across-the-board lift in fuel costs for, for all shipping. Uh, so it is factored in as an expectation. We do forecasts on you know, heavy fuel oil, uh, ultra low sulfur fuel oil. We have forecasts for all those products. They do make its way into the shipping cost uh, view on the forward uh, horizon. All right, we have time for one more question. Hi, yeah, I was just curious. It's hard to quantify, obviously, but have you tried to think through what uh, impact on your demand estimate um, a global recession might have if it happened over the next five years? Wow, that's the wild card. Um, I, we're not in the business of really forecasting economic changes like that. I mean, we have a very standard GDP forecast inflator, uh, but you're right. I mean, that's, that's the single biggest risk. I mean, of course, the tariffs is a, is a, is a risk in, in some of the areas we're looking at, such as the development of the liquefaction capacity and what's the next FID. But you're right. I mean, if we do, if these sanctions and trade wars become so profound, or other geopolitical events, that it puts real headwinds on uh, normal GDP growth, then it would affect everything. But we haven't built a forecast to look at that. Maybe somebody should hire us to do a scenario case, and we'd have a reason to. Excellent. Well, thank you, Rick, for such an awesome session. Can we all thank Rick for his remarks? Thank you. All right, just a couple of quick reminders. First, we have our balloon drop in the expo at 3 o'clock or so. So make your way into the expo for that event. There's lots of great prizes that you can win. I saw the gift cards. There's some really good ones in there. So be sure to be there around 3 o'clock. And then our closing sessions. We have two wonderful sessions that we have saved the best for last for you today. We have a session at 3.30 on game-changing technology that features three of our most dynamic CEOs in the industry. And then we have our 2018 election panel immediately after. So it is definitely worth sticking around for those two sessions, and we hope to see you back here. Thanks so much.